Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Science Thursday, we're going to talk about free piston engines. We had liquid piston, now we have free piston. <laughs> so let's dive deep into it. So what exactly is the problem? Well, most combustion engines, specifically internal combustion engines, uh, have something known as a reciprocating mass, meaning something that is going up and down, up and down, up and down. And uh, somehow from that up and down motion, you have to create spin, aka spin loads, be it generator, be it wheels, be it fan, whatever have you, you have to spin something. And that creates an issue. Because again, you are, whenever, like in, in physics, it's very simple. Whenever you are changing something, you're gonna waste some energy. So so if you are changing reciprocating motion into rotational, you will spend energy on that. So that's a thing, that's physics based thing is going to be a thing. And it adds a lot of mass and complexity. Even if the energy loss is not an issue, mass and complexity is. Complexity is for manufacturing, mass is for your power to weight ratio. So that's the thing, that's why jet engines are so efficient. It's like air comes in, air goes out, the end, nothing else happens. <laughs> so. Um, that's the whole point. So you have mass and complexity and not to mention that conversion stage, it's very messy plus it requires oil. Most of the oil is in the crank itself. It has to lubricate all those parts, so to say. So now again, these machines were awesome. They got us here. But what if we could directly get power from the reciprocating motion itself? Let that be very good. What if that up and down, dinky chika, dinky chika, what if we get the energy directly from that rather than converting it? And nowadays it is possible to drive a car on electrical energy. So why not you can do something like this? Basically, uh, uh, the shake torch which, you, which we used to have and I would urge you to never buy it because A, it used to consume so much material, nobody actually makes it decently. As in, it will require a lot of copper, a very high grade magnet and a magnets on the both ends so it does not shatter or like damages itself. Yeah you're not gonna be able to afford it if in modern time as in 2025 if somebody manufactured this with the required uh, output required oomph so it's a good toy but like uh, nothing not even useful torch so but something like this better where which can like okay it can provide enough power to drive a car or a truck or a ship so that's the problem like we have some inherent limitation what can we do to bypass that limitation so the oldest design that actually worked was uh, this sort of system. Basically, piston did the job of boom because he, you have to understand this is in 1950s. Jet engines were very new. While the idea and the concept were amazing, it's just that the metallurgy was not there. Steel blades were not good enough. And be mindful, we have super alloys that can handle upwards of 1300 degrees Celsius. That time they were barely reaching 700 degrees Celsius. So at low temperature, the jet engine cycle is not that efficient. So we had jet engines. We had turbines, it was just like not good enough. So somebody came up with the idea, it's like, what does turbine need? Turbine needs massive flow, like GG amount of hot gases going through it. So what is piston good at? Making GG amounts of hot gases. Heck, it has so much energy, you can spin an air compressor from it. We call it turbo. So somebody is like, okay, what if we turbocharge that puppy? So the idea is your piston only does one thing, create hot boom gas and turbine drives your load, so to say. So this is the idea of it and your exhaust will spin the turbine and that will do your load as in your work. So this section that free piston is classified as gas generator, nothing more. It takes the liquid fuel, it takes air and gives you whoosh, nothing more than that. It's a basically super high fancy flamethrower. So that is there. And how would you make sure the two free piston actually is uh, working as intended? Because again, they're free, they, they could be out of sync. You will have some linkages like this, which will make sure they are coming in at the same point, going out at the same time. Top dead center, bottom dead center. They can do it in sync. It has to be in sync. And uh, that solves your sinking problem. How do you breathe this puppy? Well, to breathe, it supply relies on two stroke principle and uh, it has reed valves on the chamber. So basically that T-joint, so that uh, big surface area, that goes back. Now on the back side, there is air spring. It does not have an actual spring. It has an air mass that is sealed enough that it creates that oomph pressure. So spring pressure is there uh, that goes back. Basically boom event happened that starts to go back. Now going backwards, it creates a suction force, opens the reed valve, sucks in the air. Now after after suction it has to go there okay now it's starting to compress the air and the reed valve closes and then another valve which is a disc non-returning valve that opens that goes into here now this system is designed such a way that exhaust port will open first and whoosh you get your gases and once that most of the gases are going away the air intake will open and do the scavenging 
and then once the both ports are closed then you do your fuel injection that's the lobe that you see that was for the fuel injection lobe and then you go boom so it did work they made it it worked and it was a thing it was a thing basically you pick up a phone call a company company is going to bring this thing to you it was not some like lab experiment they put multiple of this there was a power plant uh, multiple megawatt power plant there was a locomotive that had two of these puppies one of those big puppies were capable of 1000 horsepower oomph gases and you're supposed to put turbine they put a uh, this in ore carriers as in like this is before container ship become a thing so how would you the big ships were at that time were basically ore carriers big heavy things so the idea was you can have four gas generators and you can have one massive turbine and benefit was that you can keep it running and service each of the component without downtime so they did that. This puppy had two of them. Uh, they had a power plant which had a ring uh, chamber where all the gases goes into that ring. A ring dumped into uh, basic that gases into the turbine. Turbine worked, and it worked. That's the good part. It worked, but it had pulsating output. You can inherently understand it. Like boom, boom, boom. It's pulsating. Our turbine hates that. Turbine is like no. I'm a smooth operator. You have to give me smooth steam or smooth exhaust. You do not go boom, 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 boom on me. So. Fundamentally, that did create an issue and this engine had like very uh, bad sweet spot problem as in if it's in sweet spot, it's awesome. The moment you go a little bit up and down, it's like, nope, it kaputs it. Basically, this was only even theoretically entertained simply because this was too early for diesel engine to catch up. Diesel engine bitch slapped this. It's just that there was a time where diesel engine was evolving and this was like ready to go. So there was a gap where this actually made sense for some people and they tried it. But jet engine became very uh, good very quickly and uh, jet engine always had that problem. That's why locomotives which they went into jet engine, they quickly went out of it. It's simply because jet engine loves to be at fixed load as in like how the jet plane jet engine works. You take off, the end. There is nothing more than that. It goes there, pilot sets it to 80% or whatever the flight level is, the end. Engine does not do anything after that. It's like, bro, me good. How long it can do that? As long as it's needed. And if you're talking about military crafts, it can keep doing it as long as you refuel it. So 40 hour is doable. Uh, so turbines are really awesome in those sort of scenarios. But when you're talking about vehicular use, they need a lot of range. And uh, this cannot do that. So it sucked in every way and not to mention for some reason it had a lot, even though they talk about oh it has so few parts, which is true, it did not last it that long. As in like people built it, used it and it's like, ooh, maintenance. So this was the first time somebody figured out a free, uh, basically crankless combustion engine. It did work and again, you can make it and use it, but it's just like not really that, uh, what you call, viable, so to say. Then we come to somebody figured out what if we designed a Stirling engine instead of internal combustion engine, what if we had external combustion engine? All Stirling engines are external combustion engine. And that gives them the advantage that heat can come from anywhere. Meaning if you have a lot of mirrors focusing a spot and you have solar concentrator, go ahead. If you have a nuclear reactor, go ahead. If you have a methane burner, go ahead. You have ammonia burner, go YOLO. You can do whatever you want. As long as you can create heat, the machine will work. So that's the good part. And in that, there are a lot of crank design. Basically, you have a lot of crank system. Philips makes some amazing ones. They have crank. Somebody's like, hey, what if we throw away the crank and put springs there? Basically, the oscillation action is still happening. But instead of crank, you have a uh, spring. So would it still work? Yes, because you can put magnets in the center and you can get energy out of the coils. So that was one option. People tried it. And then somebody realized this actually, instead of uh, basically heat engine it behaves better as a heat pump basically replace the gas from uh, whatever they had generally with helium and now it becomes cryo cooler meaning right now if you want to buy uh, engineer who are best at it just ask for hey is any engineer able to do free piston sterling engine nobody will say yes say any engineer is good at uh, cryo coolers most of them are doing this so this is how we can actually do amazing things with free piston. Now, NASA has been working their ass off for years and some solar companies are also trying to do that. I have not seen any solar working and uh, NASA's aim was the spring is the weak point because again, it will break and eventually wear out. So the idea was instead of having RTG that is have like a nuclear hot source and then basically Peltier effects, which are very low efficiency, like 3% efficiency. What if you had like 15% efficiency or even 20% from a Stirling engine? So they designed it and they had like everything was gas floating system. Nothing was touching. That was the first requirement. 
you cannot touch if you touch it it will wear down very quickly and the idea is you're supposed to have same lifespan as voyager you put it and forget it so they did manage to do it and bigger version was this puppy which is uh, nasa's key low water reactor so you have a nuclear boom boom happening reactor not a, a plutonium and hot radioactive no reactor fission happening here sodium heat pipes and then a sterling engine on top and uh, both of them have tried to work. The solar industry has a lot of designs. NASA has working designs. It just never pick up. But here's the deal. As a heat pump, this puppy is like, me good. You want liquid nitrogen? Me good. You want liquid helium? Me good. This is good. Like if you want to go really low temperature, this is like, I'm your man. Like I, I got this. So free piston Stirling engine. Let's try to understand how cry cooler works. Do it in reverse. That's the engine part. Nobody has ever actually managed to figure out how to have very high usability or usefulness to it. Uh, and Stirling engine is one of those things which on paper everybody's like, oh, this is efficient. In reality, it's poo poo. That's why we don't use it. Unless you have that specific requirement like a Swedish submarine that can be very stealthy. Other than that, there is no really benefit of using this. Or NASA where it's like, hey, we need something that does not have touching parts. No touchy touchy. Yeah, it could work. Now we come to another brand uh, that uh, repopularized this idea. This is Aquarius, uh, Israeli company, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, they have the closest design to single stroke engine simply because uh, piston at top dead center goes boom, a piston at bottom dead center still goes boom. And I'm like, wait, wait, how? Well, piston is basically two pistons. Instead of going like this, they're going. So her top dead center of one is bottom dead center of the other. So that's how they are achieving. So it's a shaft that is going like this, piston is like this. So, and uh, it has only one moving part and the manufacturers of this was very proud of that part that it has only one thing. The end is just a one shaft that is going back and forth. And they're gonna have a magnetic clamp on top, uh, side as in you have a clamp going like this, and then you're gonna put a coil there. Now, uh, I understood how the heck it is exhausting. I understood how it's doing compression, how I understood how it has like, you know, spark plug, fuel injector, all that. I'm still having a hard time understanding how the heck it, this engine breathes. The air, because again, they're showing that they have a hollow shaft, cool, but where the air in the hollow shaft coming from? Because if it's 15 PSI, the moment you uh, put the chamber in, it's, it's not gonna be 15 PSI because the hollow shaft, now you have a sealed system, it will try to, you know, and be mindful, there is exhaust gases there. Some exhaust gas will still linger. So it's like, how will you charge enough air there? Like getting the air in, compression part is solved. How the heck you are getting air in? Because the sports, maybe, maybe I could uh, be wrong is that engineer has designed the CAD model in such a way that you cannot disattain that, but it may work if you have a very long, uh, what you call, port, maybe. But uh, that's why, like, again, I fail to understand how the heck this engine breathes. And even with turbo, I'm like, how will it work? As in, it almost looks like it carries the air into the pipe pipe goes and pipe dumps the air into the chamber. I'm like, that could work. Of course, it could work. It's just that it's not enough air because you have to pressurize the hell out of it. Uh, so eh. generator is external to this design and uh, you cannot easily add two of this to balance it out. Why? Because again, the boom event is happening in the center. They have a shaft that is connected on the end as in like you have a giant uh, plate and that plate has the magnet and all that that is going back and forth. So in their own design, in their own CAD models, they have multiple stacks and they are synced, meaning they are going like this, not like, you know, it's not happening like that. So vibration will not be very stable. So, uh, so what's the update on it? Well, this is real. Nothing after this is real. Basically, the company is almost like in a limbo state. They're like, okay, we're going to make energy chargers. We're going to make this. The last update was like, you know, January 2023. So uh, I do not know what the hell happened with them. And again, uh, people who are looking into stock market, they're like, yeah, they might have cash strap issue. So I do not know what the hell happened with them. And again, full disclosure, I do not understand how the heck this engine breathes. So... And again, two stroke is not an issue and using both ends of the piston is really clever. So there are some good elements to that. If I could understand how the heck it breathes. Uh, but I like the idea that it has only one moving part. That's good. So this is Aquarius, uh, another company that made it popular. Now we come to opposed chamber. We have already talked about opposed cylinders, uh, sorry, opposed pistons. There is opposed chamber also. And yes, in free piston design, some companies are also trying that where they have free pistons, opposed piston. Um, but I'm, I'm like, I'm not gonna talk about that. So this is opposed chamber. So you have a, sh a common mover, basically a rod, and this rod goes back and forth, back and forth. And both ends, it has pistons, and those pistons are in the chamber. So it oscillates. Now, benefit of this design is that you can have two stroke 
and a four stroke meaning you have a choice you can even do like okay this side works on four stroke this side works on uh, two stroke although i do not have any idea why would you use four stroke on this because it does not have the luxury of four stroke four stroke requires very good valve control valve has to be synced with the motion crankshaft does solve that issue like your valve will be perfectly timed you do not have to worry about it like once you tune it the end go home here, how the heck you control the valve? This, so this is from Toyota's design. And the valve, they have a giant line saying like, you know, hydro pneumatic uh, electrical actuator. I'm like, what? Now, to be fair, uh, do we have electrical systems that can open and close puppet valves almost same as like a normal kind of Of course. Can we do it? No. Why not? We can't afford it. It's, it will require too much copper, too much electrical infrastructure to like actually do it. And that's why the company Free Valve was supposed to do that. They still have a giant air compressor. So best I have seen is that people will use solenoid as a gate where the solenoid is doing the timing and pneumatic as in like the air compressed air is doing the actual actuation. So that's the most hard part. That's why I'm like uh, not that uh, comfortable with this design of like, having basically you know, uh, four stroke, because again, how the heck you time it? Because in two stroke, you can just have ports. You do not need that. Like it will be almost like CV engines, two stroke design, where backside of the piston is doing the compression, front side is doing it, and the ports open up. It's not that difficult, it is doable. And again, you can even get that uh, natural aspiration. So you do not need turbo. So two stroke makes sense. Four stroke, I have no idea. And again, given the fact that Toyota has been working on it for 20 years, uh, that kind of proves my point, because I can easily see these things there. Everybody's like, oh, this is cheap. I can believe it. The moment you do not talk about valve, I'm like, nah, nah, bruh. Like those valves, they're so small units. Yeah, that's not how it works. And if you use pneumatic systems, most pneumatic systems are not rated for same lifespan as an engine puppet valve. Lifespan has like few zeros missing. So that's the whole thing. That's like, I could see this design working with two stroke because again, the backside could do the compression and you can have port on the side. Again, I have designed this, so uh, designed this as in like two stroke mechanism for CV engine. Uh, Ron designed it, so I see it and made it in CAD, so I inherently understand it. It is doable, not that difficult. Uh, so you can do that. Four stroke, I have no idea. But the, where's the engine part? As that is in the center. The common rod has the magnets and you have a coil, and that's how you get the electricity out directly. Now, because it has a complete unit, basically common rod, piston, generator, it's a common unit, you can stack multiple of that. Basically make the stack as big as possible, then stack as many as possible, and voila. And this way you can have very good balancing characteristics because one is going this way, another is going there. So if you have three of them, you can balance them out such a way that it's like, not no vibration, like nothing. So, there is a university that is working on it. There is a Toyota that has been working on it. Uh, but like, uh, again, if they think like two, four strokes gonna work, I'm like, no. While you can make the design, I'm like, let that be clear. Nothing in physics is saying it can't be done. Engineering is saying like, bro, we can push it. Economics is saying, bitch, please. Because again, you're gonna lose all the oh, economic benefit. You're gonna lose all of that the moment you have to have that electronic uh, valve control with same lifespan as other systems. It is difficult to have a valve that opens and closes and you do not have to think about it. Doing that electrically, ooh. Ask free valve. They have been trying it for eight years and they are just doing valves and they're still there like, yeah, we can't do this with electrical. Have a giant air compressor powering that puppy. And if you're like, why the heck that did not work? That's the reason. It takes so much energy to drive valves fast enough, reliable enough, synced enough that doing it electrically is like brutal. Two stroke bypasses that issue because it's just like, hey, ports they open up at the right time they close at the right time you do not have to do anything so this is the opposed cylinder uh, in two stroke I, I can put some money behind it if they're like no we're gonna make four stroke i'm out unless they specify like how the heck they're running the valve strain so this is opposed chamber design topologies and all that so this was my presentation on uh, basically free piston topologies. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please hit the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.